And I want to acknowledge the traditional lands that we're on. And I invite you, of course, at home, you can use the chat to introduce the land that you're joining us from today. But as we're here in the room, even at home, maybe we can take a deep breath together, rounding our feet to the ground, and just really taking a moment to pause and recognize how indigenous wisdom and indigenous people have helped us for thousands of years. So here at Rail Road, we recognize the Likwagan speaking people, the Sunhi and Esquimal nations. And it is with deep gratitude that we learn, work, play, love, where the past, present and future of indigenous and non-indigenous people come together. So thank you for that. I think it's very important to start our meetings that way. And we're here for Employers Connect on Climate Action. So I hope everyone is at the good space. Uh, thank you for joining again. And I just want to let you know about the Career Innovation Project. So why do we do those events? And I think some people maybe in the room or online, you have participated in the past, but we really want to build connection with the industry and our students. So I know we have students here in global management, climate action leadership, tourism management. So it's really about connecting employers, organization, nonprofit, and having that opportunity to chat together. So we know when we graduate, sometimes we don't really know how to find a career or even how to find an apply uh, learning project or an internship. So this is why we're here uh, with the Career Innovation Project at Railroad University. And with us today, so I'm glad, Brent, you're here, uh, just in front of me. I hope you can see him at, at home. So Brent is with Nature Block, and I have some notes here. I'll just, I know you will do a way better job than me to introduce yourself, but the little notes I have here for Nature Blocks is take carbon management to the next level. So from startup to established enterprise, from voluntary to regulated, they have you covered. And I know you'll have more time to explain what you do. And then I have Claire and Harika. You can wave here in the, <laughs> in the room. So Claire and Harika are joining us online on Zoom here. And I've practiced that. And I know my manager is in the chat and she'll laugh because I've been practicing that name for a week now. Mech LLA? Mech LLA? Uh, I hope I'm close enough. <laughs> it's a hard one for a French speaking person. Mm -hmm. But congratulations for your team, because I said that you're Canada's top 100 employers for 2024, and you are the oldest independently owned engineering and land surveying firm in Canada, funded in 1910. So that's a long time ago. And your multidisciplinary team can take your project from planning to construction and everything in between. And I know Claire, we chatted about Climate Solution, which is under your portfolio, and Harika is joining us in a recruitment perspective. So if people have questions about employment, internship, et cetera, et cetera. We have uh, Geneviève Bruneau. Hi, nice to see you here. Development Manager at Indigenous Tourism um, of Canada. And what we call HITAC is a global leader in the marketing and development of Indigenous tourism experiences in Canada through a unified Indigenous a tourism industry voice, ITEC focuses on marketing, product development support, and creating partnership between association, organization, government, department, and industry leaders from across Canada to support the growth of indigenous tourism in Canada. So we're looking forward for the conversation with you, Geneviève. And it's interesting when I study for the folks here in tourism, I studied tourism back in Quebec 20 years ago. And I recall how high tech was like, oh my God, this is such an organization I love. And I'm grateful you can join us today to learn more. Mm -hmm. And we have Mark that will be joining us, I guess, in a few minutes. And you know, when we talk about networking opportunities and how sometimes life brings people into your life, um, I met Mark at uh, the dock down in Victoria. So the dock is a working space, kind of a share working space. And I was there one day just doing my thing. Uh, and then we started chatting, Mark and I, and he was telling me about the amazing work he's doing in Africa uh, with the sorghum, which is a type of crop that he will tell us about. And Mark is working for Agriculture Resilience Incentive. So the sorghum, and I hope I pronounce it well, is extreme drought tolerant plant and can also be cultivated in areas where there's a shortage of water. So moreover, the nutritional value of sorghum is similar to maize. And I know he's doing a lot of work there with some uh, local communities. So we'll hear from Mark, hopefully when you find the, the room here on campus. 
And this is the next event, so I'll stop sharing here and tell you more about that later. I'll have a look at the chat, but maybe if we want, let's start with Brent that is in the room with us. Do you want to Thank take you. maybe a five, seven minutes to let us know what you do? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, NatureBlocks was created as a carbon platform for small businesses to large enterprise. And we like to focus, I think the best way to explain that environment right now is uh, from what the end result is. And that would be if you're in a compliance market versus a voluntary market. Voluntary being a company who's not regulated, that is, sees this as either a, uh, a vision or a mission of the company to be sustainable and do their part, or as a marketing uh, opportunity. So they're looking for uh, a, a way to showcase. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> We put you on the spot right here. Thank you for joining. <laughs> yeah, so to showcase all the efforts, uh, there's examples in Victoria that you've done worldwide companies that have uh, spending capital. Uh, generally, that is the first part is the, the emissions of the business and work their way backwards. So, you know, parts of that uh, in, in the compliance market, you've got the peer systems for a company, for example. They're required uh, to report reduced emissions. They have targets that are set out where they have penalties. Uh, right now, they're working their way up to 170 uh, Canadian dollars per ton of CO2 uh, in that cap system. So it's, it's quite heavy. So for them, they're focusing on the compliance uh, portion. And as you work back, there's certain components to that. And that's the auditability of their greenhouse gas emissions, as well as the reductions. So following certain standards, uh, greenhouse gas uh, protocol, you have the uh, science-based targeting on the reduction. So tying all these different systems in. So Nature Blocks handles the footprinting. So for a compliance or voluntary customer, we involve uh, AI to do all of the, as we're talking about, uh, some people in the room here, all the complex calculations uh, and a, a scope assignment between your scope one, two, and three as well as the correct, uh, if you are going to follow a standard end report, it's more for the compliance market, but you have to have your references. The references have to have a certain time bound. You have to have your boundaries uh, defined, you know, your operational or financial control, uh, any omissions, you have to have detailed documentation for that. So our, our, our platform uh, follows, if you could use QuickBooks, you could use our, uh, our footprint accounting. It's in a tree format. You can import data that way but we're involving a lot more AI right now. So if you were to say select, if you're in the oil and gas industry or you're a coffee shop, if you're a coffee shop, uh, that's your stated business and you'll preload where uh, those uh, uh, different departments or the way you've organized. Generally, if you go into an account, you have the different uh, administration, you go through operations, procurement, et cetera. So we start to look at your individual line items. We've built a, an, OC, an optical character recognition. So any receipts or invoices, it parses that data and starts to make recommendations based on lower carbon intensity uh, alternatives. Or if you have uh, lighting or, you know, Fortis, for example, as one of your expenses on, on your scope, uh, uh, scope one emissions or scope two emissions, that will recommend different ways if it's a lighting scheme, if it's a HVAC unit, if it's a leakage. So we, we actually use the AI to start parsing and uh, going through our templated reductions that of other companies that have had success with. And then you can track those emissions and start those initiatives that all are representative in your reductions or your shareability page. If you're a voluntary and in the compliance world, there's offsetting. So there's project development and offsetting. So these project development pieces would be the creation of a project from start to finish. And we look at, we're a standards agnostic platform. So you could pick gold, Vera, you can look at uh, uh, different voluntary credits, or you can look at uh, different regulatory frameworks, uh, such as the EU ETS and Article 6.2 that they're still going through in uh, with COP28 right now. So that end result is either, as I mentioned, a compliance or a regulated, uh, or, or uh, sorry, a voluntary, and each step of that is documented through our process, uh, through being able to measure, recognize hotspots, make your reductions, state the reductions, have it audible, and then be able to report that. So it works for a, a hotel, a coffee shop, also works for a, a large industrial producer or uh, extraction uh, company. So that's more or less what NatureBlocks does. And we started in 2019, 
and have been building the models because it's inherently difficult to calculate to get primary data sets. So that's scraping as much data as we possibly can, looking at open um, uh, inventories of greenhouse gases or, or uh, life cycle analysis documents and trying to build the largest database so that when you take a picture of a, uh, a receipt, uh, it could be a, a meal out uh, anywhere in town, it'll parse every one of those and give you as many primary data sets as possible so that you're not using just generic EPA data. So you're getting a very accurate representation. Mm. Yeah. Um, any questions on that side? There's a lot more detail and, and technical piece to it, but I, more or less the high level is we satisfy both markets and a lot of it's just automated. That's wonderful, yeah. yeah. And how did you come to that work? Uh, having frustration with Excel sheets and looking at, uh, uh, we actually, on the African side, we uh, was in Africa for all of August and I was doing an afforestation project in Limpopo in, in South Africa. And we, it was a Moringa afforestation. So it was degraded farmland. Being able to quantify that whole process and be able to document that, it's all done on Excel right now and you're using consultants. So we started to look at breaking down these standards and these monitoring plans uh, and all the calculations that goes into diameter of breast height and the, and the uh, wet weight to dry weight and all these calculations I'm sure you're you're aware of in that space and automate that so when someone selects a uh, if it's a carbon sequestration type that they select that template and all of that groundwork of the, the methodology under which standard is all documented so they can just start filling in data such as Here's pictures, here's the planting scheme, here's the clear ownership. They can start going through the additionality pieces of proving out a project so that they can have this validated and go through the verification and issuance process. And we built a marketplace internally uh, to, to sell these offsets. So, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a so, lot. And I know students like myself were like, oh, Excel sheet, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, good memory. Excel hell is what we like to, it's just uh, trying to get away from that and making it accessible because uh, there's lots of really, you know, there's a company that we're, it's not one of our customers, Cowop, and they're just taking local produce in Duncan and trying to bring that to a one retail uh, and they do delivery, but it's, they're using Excel and they're looking at Google, trying to find these different factors for a John Deere you know, tractor, right? Or, or, or combine. And it's, it's so difficult. So, um, having a solution that's affordable, but it's also easy to use, right? You can drop a CSV, you can type in a factor, you know, what is the emissions of this? This is how many kilometers, or this is how many liters it burns, et cetera. And they'll start to create these factors. So something that you can go in, reconcile, just like you would if you were in QuickBooks, you do a monthly reconcile, uh, reconcile and then it produces a report at the end. And that's something that you can advertise via QR code. If you're a coffee shop or, you know, the co-op, they can also represent as more of, they can fill in the, the environmental side of a, an ESG report. Uh, we're working with Mosaic right now and modernizing that report, something that's auditable because you can talk about all these things and emissions and where your scope three emissions were, but something that shows in a very granular way that someone can uh, dissect. If you're that one out of 10 people at the, uh, that will be the, the holiday dinner table, right? Who, um, you know, questions every company on the greenwashing. Uh, with our software, you can get into every single process that company made public, such as their airline travel, any reductions that they've made, their single-use plastics, their water usage, waste diversion, every single piece. So much more dynamic report that'll hopefully add transparency to the companies that are cheating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's way a long way around that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, just uh, getting away from Excel sheets and adding transparency and dynamic uh, uh, reports. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank yeah. you. And just for the folks online and even Mark, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks, we have student and the climate action leadership here. We have uh, environment and management, tourism management, global management, and I'll see online who is there. But do you want to introduce yourself, Mark, and what you do? I just gave a really quick overview of yourself. Yeah, and sure. And we've heard from the others on the panel. Or... Not yet. Okay. All right. Um, is it okay if I'm and we're not doing slides, I guess. No, are you okay, okay with that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, easy, yeah. No, nope, sure. Um, okay, well, uh, hello everyone online and in the classroom here. Uh, thanks, Nancy and everyone at the Royal Roads team for uh, for having me. And uh, yeah, also I'd like to acknowledge the Lekwungen speaking people and, you know, more broadly the Coast Salish nations who have been stewards of this land where meeting on today. 
But uh, yeah, I'm Mark Brown. Um, right now, my primary work is with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, working on uh, an agric agricultural transformation strategy for the Middle East, North Africa region. But uh, what I'm here talking to you guys more about today is uh, a, uh, a charity that I manage called um, Agricultural Resilience Incentives. We operate currently in Eastern Zambia. And, um, you know, when we when we look at the climate challenges that we're facing today, um, there's an awful lot about there's, you know, we have to do better to to meet these goals. We need to reduce emissions. We need to look into carbon sequestration. Um, and one of the things that's also a reality right now is um, climate change is happening. You know, we are in the future. We're like our 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 toes or are up to our knees in uh, the doomsday is starting to get here a little bit. And and what we're working on is um, climate resilience and adaptation. So um, if I just you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with Eastern Zambia, the the context is that uh, most households in Eastern Zambia are um, farming households. Um, a, a lot of households have, um, over 50% of households have farming as their primary source of, uh, resource income for the family. So it's, you know, farming to, farming to feed your family. And if we look like maybe a hundred years ago, um, families would have been farm, farming, pardon me, families would have been farming a crop called sorghum. Or they could have been one of the other um, ancient grains in, indigenous to that part of uh, Zambia and and Africa, but then and and it was used to make uh, a food. the The staple food is called nshima. It's a it's a it's a grain flour based starch that basically accompanies your stews. So you know you think a lot of other cultures in Latin America, a lot of uh, times, you know, tortilla accompanies everything. Some Asian countries, it's rice and, you know, parts of India, it might be, um, non-bread Europe, it's bread, whatever. So, right. It's like your, it's your, um, your starchy staple. So then when colonization came, uh, to Zambia, it was almost completely transitioned from, uh, sorghum to corn. Corn became the most dominant crop, and it's not it's not just that it was um you know there were some reasons why it did make a bit of sense as well. It was you know it's a globally traded commodity it um you know is pathway to the global market. so you saw even after um Zambian independence, corn was still very heavily promoted. but you know you fast forward to the twenty twenties and the late. 20 teens, uh, we started experiencing, especially in Zambia's uh, lowest rainfall agroecological zones, in tremendous challenges with corn cultivation and, and um, instances of acute crop failure as well. So when we're dealing with households where, um, you know, we're talking about farming to put food on the table for the family, this obviously has very dire consequences. So uh, what we're working on at Agri is bringing sorghum back into the area, making seeds available, providing um, agronomy technical expertise and extension services. And then the third thing that we do is we offer um, a small uh, just cash transfer. It's essentially a subsidy for experimenting with the transition to the adoption of sorghum. The reason why we include this cash transfer is we want to, you know, acknowledge and recognize that when you're in the high stakes game of deciding what to farm to feed your family, um, transitioning crops is taking a bit of a risk. And it's, it's a very small cash transfer. It's about 15 bucks, but um, it was something that we noticed just helped farming families 
um, with the transition as they as they made the decisions for that for the trade off there. And we don't we don't uh, you know push people to go wholesale into sorghum. The program that we run is at, is actually just for a quarter hectare. So you know it can be uh, it can be one of the small like a modest area of the farm, but it's just for folks to get a feel for this um, you know ancient grain that would have been cultivated in an earlier time. Um, and 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 pardon me, the the reason why we're promoting it is it is just more climate resilient. It's got this um, wonderful, robust root structure where in periods of low rainfall, um, it can it can do very well. Um, and even in instances of flooding, that same root structure helps it get a better grip on the on the soil. So, um, yeah, with, with with climate change, we've noticed it's been just an incredible help. Over ninety percent of our farmers, when surveyed, have said that they want to continue using sorghum. They want to continue ex exploring it. And uh, in the the most significant drought that we've had since running the program, we still had over eighty two percent of our participants said uh, they felt that their household was more food secure than they would have been if they hadn't grown sorghum. So it's it's something that's been uh, very interesting to us. You know, I don't think that we're at a perfection yet and are still are still working our way through and and learning as we're as we're growing but we've now scaled from from uh 40 40 farming families um when we first started in the 2018 19 season to uh over 600 farmers or farming families uh that we're working with now and uh yeah looking forward to to seeing more and we also don't want to stay limited just to the uh, sorghum as a replacement for corn issue. But I think we're also just really interested in just more generally how uh, this model of introducing crop alternatives um, that are climate resilient and appropriate for humans and um, supporting that transition can can help in, in other contexts as well. Thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, I remember when we met, I was very amazed by the work you do and the collaboration. I think it's about hearing what the people need and then working with them instead of telling what, what to do. Mm -hmm. And I was telling you, I'm like, oh, this is what we learned at school and you're doing it, that's awesome. <laughs> so we'll come back with question. And maybe Claire and Harika, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. So I can uh, I can start there. So um, first of all, uh, thank you everybody for, for attending. Uh, my name is Claire Cher, and I uh, use the personal pronoun she and her. Um, and I'd just like to start off um, by acknowledging that, that I'm speaking to you today from the, unfortunately, very wet, um, currently territory of the Haiza Nation here in Kedamat in northern BC. Um, and I'm very proud to call the Haiza Nation not just my neighbours, but also my my colleagues and friends and that's something that that's my personal journey towards reconciliation is um actually connecting with them on a on a personal level to understand the challenges that their community has faced and continues to face and and um the discussion of climate action i think ties in very well and um, when we're thinking about um in indigenous communities and i know we've got others on the on the uh, discussion today who will be talking to that in more general terms um, but a little bit about me um, so I am a civil engineer um, you can probably tell by my accent that I am not from Canada myself um, I, I come from the UK I've been here in Canada about 10 years now and I started my career in the field of flood risk management it was something that the way that flooding is dealt with in Europe is is quite different to how it has been dealt with here in Canada and, and times are sort of changing. But um, I spent uh, many years practicing in that area, looking at how we can make communities more resilient to flooding um, and how we can take action to mitigate against uh, against flooding. And over the last few years, that um, that idea of resilience, as we just heard Mark talking about that, um, has morphed from not just being looking at how can we make our communities more resilient to flooding, but of course, one of the, the major things that affects flooding is, of course, climate change. And so I've sort of, my, my career has, has kind of 
moved a little over into looking at um, uh, climate risk. So not just flood risk. So looking at what are the, the risks that we are seeing um, to our communities that come about as a result of climate change. And in the kind of in the in the McElhaney sphere, you heard uh, Nancy mention at the beginning there that McElhaney has been around since 1910, which is um, a great a great story to tell in terms of of our history. But you know, recognizing um, and I can say this as an engineer and any other engineers in the room, I apologize in advance. But um, you know, a, a Engineers have not always been the most forward thinking when it comes to to changes in um, just in how how society is going. But over the last few years, there has been a real acknowledgement amongst the engineering industry and, and in specifically when thinking about infrastructure that climate change is going to affect our infrastructure. Our communities need to think about is is our infrastructure going to be resilient to climate change and the answer in a lot of cases is no, it isn't, because it was never designed with the consideration for climate change in mind. And that is something that we recognized here at McElhaney that, um, you know, we're doing a lot of uh, engineering design um, and doing a lot of work with communities to come up with these new pieces of infrastructure, but maybe not always recognizing that whilst it might meet the needs of the community today, Will it still continue to meet those needs when we see increased rainfall um, or, you know, uh, increased temperatures? Um, and that is something that we um, we we looked at here at McElhaney. We actually um, have built a new group. It's a group that I am part of, which is our sustainability services advisory group. And it's looking at how can we make how can we make more sustainable decisions around infrastructure? How can we ensure that the the projects that we are delivering for communities will meet the needs of those communities in a changing climate. And, you know, that may be, you know, maybe something quite small about, you know, is the, is as I look out at the rain falling through up past my window here, is our stormwater system, is a, are the ditches big enough to convey what these flows are going to look like? But it's about more than just the physical changes. It's about what does this mean to society? And when we think about, um, using flooding as an example if we you know we can acknowledge that climate change is going to bring about more rainfall which increases the risk of flooding so yeah more more places are going to get flooded but what does that mean on a societal level what does it mean to our communities well all of a sudden like our elder, elderly community suddenly um has got now big accessibility concerns because we're talking about maybe flood water that is deep enough or shallow enough that somebody of good strong mobility can walk through it, but maybe somebody with less mobility or more challenges, all of a sudden now becomes confined to their home. And what does that mean in terms of our society? And what does it mean in terms of how we connect as a community? Are we talking about the fact that, um, um, is it a more vulnerable population that, that's gonna be affected? And unfortunately, it's just kind of the way that communities have developed. We often find that, uh, the vulnerable communities tend to be in the areas that um, tend to reside in areas that are more um, more at risk of flooding, for example. But, you know, is it also looking about um, some of our, our transient population and, and how how do they become aware of these changes and what it means to them? Maybe they're not as well connect, connected to sort of community um, communication channels. And I think that is something that as an industry in engineering, we um, in particular when I talk about engineering, I'm referring to civil engineering and, and infrastructure design. Um, we have become a lot more aware of, of the, the bigger picture of these decisions and designs that we're making and ensuring that we are supporting communities so they can become more resilient. And looking at, like I say, I talked about rainfall as, as an example, but also, you know, we've, we're coming off the back of a terrible wildfire season that we we know is is only going to continue and and are our communities ready for that and in lots of cases they're not because it just isn't necessarily something that was was thought about in those in those early stages of community planning and so that's here at McElhaney that's um an area of work that like I say we are growing it is a a newer area for us because it's kind of a newer area for our industry but about looking at helping helping our clients um to look at 
at the sustainability of their communities and ways that they can become more resilient to the impacts of climate change and understanding what those risks are. That's kind of the area that I work in is, you know, undertaking climate risk assessments. What what are the biggest risks to our community? Is it increased rainfall or is it actually that we've got increased temperatures and you know, none of our public buildings have air conditioning. Well, maybe air conditioning isn't the most sustainable solutions. Are there other things that we can do? So combining combining sort of the, the climate change mitigation piece, but crucially looking at that adaptation piece as well. And, and how can we build these communities that are going to be able to weather the changes, if you'll pardon that pun. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about, uh, about my group here at McElhaney. And I'm just going to um, hand over to Harika and she can give a little bit more of a of an explanation as about our company as a whole and some of our opportunities for students as well. Thank you, Claire. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Harika and I also work alongside Claire at McElhaney, albeit I am not a technical person. I'm not an engineer. I'm probably the odd man, odd woman out in this group today. Um, I represent talent acquisition at McElhaney and I've been a part of the organization for now a year and a half. Um, but I just wanted to say kudos to Nancy. You've, you've done so well. Uh, kudos to organizing this. We're happy to be part of this conversation. And uh, you knocked it out of the park when you pronounced Michael Haney. That's kind of one of the only tasks that you can do for employees to be part of the organization. So uh, you knocked it out of the park. Um, so um, I am a visual learner, visual speaker. So I do have a few slides if you folks don't mind uh, to, to share. Awesome. Um, I'm just going to, oh, I guess my screen sharing has been disabled. So Nancy. I'll give, I'll give you that permission for sure. Just maybe a yeah, two, three minutes and then we'll go with Geneviève. Thank you. Be able to share now. It's showing up on the screen. It's showing on our end though. Hmm. Oh yeah, there we go. Awesome. All right, so as Claire pointed out, um, we are a 113 year old organization, uh, been in the uh, industry for quite a long time and have diversified beyond uh, geomatics, which is our core uh, business service offering and into civil engineering. So these are several disciplines that Michael Haney offers. Um, so just wanted to throw that as a glimpse here. And then um, Michael Haney is actually based in uh, about 33 office locations across Western Canada. Um, so that kind of, we have a tagline calling ourselves local everywhere. Um, so that is one of our unique selling propositions when it comes to opportunities, career opportunities, is that you will find a McElhaney office across Western Canada in all of these locations. Um, and we also have a couple of uh, satellite offices out in Newfoundland um, and one office in Tampa, Florida, which uh, we are going to be winding down very soon uh, with the with the plans of expanding out to the East Coast as well as the West Coast of the states. Uh, those are long term plans, maybe in 10 to 15 years. Um, just wanted to put that fun fact out there. Um, and for you to consider McElhaney, the things that we talk about to students every time they go to campus is, you know, there's equity, diversity, inclusion, as much as a is, you know, as Claire spoke, climate change, sustainability, environment is so important. Uh, we are also uh, drawing priority to what is accessible to US students within McElhaney. So we have a very renowned safety program. Uh, you know, folks tell us that how open, um, you know, opportunities they have received and feedback that they have received at McElhaney. Um, and we also, uh, you know, uh, have a specific professional development programs catering to the students. We have an education support program where we are sponsoring tuition support to uh, selected students um, and also a mentorship program, uh, giving them access to industry leading experts at McElhaney. We also have the Investments for workshops, seminars, courses, etc., to upskill yourselves. Um, another fun program we have for students is our Empower Scholarships, uh, which ties into our EDI principles um, and making real change. So we have eight different scholarship uh, categories. Unfortunately, the application deadline has closed, uh, but for next year, the applications open in the month of September and run through until November, um, just for your knowledge if you were interested. 
Um, and again, going into our committees and programs, other than um, you know uh, the different uh, professional development initiatives we have, we also have committees and programs that the students are able to be a part of and make uh, real change possible. Um, so these are several um, committees. Uh, of course, there's Green Direction, which is um, sy synonymous to uh, what Claire's currently doing at McElhaney. Uh, more towards environmental and sustainability. So that is uh, everything about McElhaney in a nutshell. Uh, but if you have any specific questions or interested about considering career opportunities with us, please feel free to reach out uh, to myself or Claire uh, here today, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. I love that. That was short and sweet. Amazing. Thank you. And I recall when I met with Claire, we were talking about even some students you work with. Um, that will continue working with your organization. So starting as a student, but then having the opportunity to build more projects within the organization. So I think I will just ask you to stop sharing here and then we'll move to Genevieve. And I have a few of my colleagues here in the room uh, from the, and even in the Zoom room for the career uh, learning and mm -hmm. development. And I would say as a student, what I will do, I will look up the name of the speaker and add them on LinkedIn. <laughs> just to build your connection when you mentioned Erika about like, yeah, ask questions. So we're here to build connection as well. So thank you for that. And Jen, can we hear from you here? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Nancy, for organizing such a lovely event. It's been great to hear from the speakers um, before me. The organizations sound amazing, and I will definitely be also looking up your names on LinkedIn and connecting. <laughs> Um, my name is Genevieve Buneau, and I am the Development Manager for the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada. I've been with the organization now for four and a half years, and my background and expertise is in sustainable and regenerative tourism development. Um, I use this knowledge as well as other um, skill sets to operate and manage many of our development programs that we um, provide to our membership base. Uh, which is over a thousand. So we are a not-for-profit Indigenous tourism association. Uh, like I said, we have over a thousand members, Indigenous tourism businesses um, across Canada that we provide programs and marketing support for. And the, the main component of, of my day-to-day -day tasks is really ensuring that we're aligning businesses with opportunities for not just like economic and business development growth, but supporting them through um, the social fabrics that they work within in their communities to ensure that they're enriching not only their community, but their livelihoods as well. Um, ensuring that they feel supported in reconnecting with their culture and their language through tourism opportunities, as well as connecting to the land in the way that they feel the most comfortable doing. So this is often expressed in, in our industry through, through business. So highlighting the rich uh, ecological zones that they live and cultivate and steward um, and this is translated through experiences and products such as um, crafting or medicinal walks. So I work with uh, a very broad range of entrepreneurs and they all have their own different uh, needs and, and ways of showcasing their authenticity. Um, so going into further around how we uh, dress or how we um, foster conversations and understanding around climate action. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting because we work in an industry that's primarily of a Western perspective. Um, while the Indigenous tourism sector comes from a very different world of view um, and one that that is very rich in knowledge and um, embodiment of the land and the people in which they live on. So my job and our industry's job is really walking between these two worlds and in method and from a methodological perspective, we use two wide seeing to address a lot of the, the, the challenges in our industry. Um, and one way that we're addressing that is through our original original accreditation program. So this is to address uh, one an issue that we saw through recent research. Uh, that we uh, had done through Leger, and this was through a consumer sentiment research project. And what we found out was that many of our travelers, whether they're international or national, um, are, are have 
uh, opposing perspectives of of Indigenous peoples across Canada. Um, 86% have a positive opinion of Indigenous peoples um, in their province and in the rest of Canada, but they still lack awareness of what their Indigenous tourism opportunities are, how to identify an Indigenous tourism operator, uh, and, and where from like a digital perspective, how to access those products and experiences. So the original original accreditation program is one of those solutions. And so businesses uh, go through a pathway of um, becoming accredited through our organization. And this highlights six different areas of um, business standards. And those six areas are community engagement, and support, visitor experience, health, safety, and comfort, sustainable Indigenous tourism, marketing and visitor services, and business acumen and practices. So our businesses uh, have to fill out an application, they go through an assessment process, and they have to answer questions within those six categories in order to meet that accreditation standard. And so this is one way for us to um, not only support that consumer demand and identifying Indigenous tourism products or experiences across Across Canada, but also supporting businesses who want to um, become more sophisticated or experienced in those areas. And so not only is it an accreditation program, but it's also a wraparound support where we're able to um, tie in um, resources, workshops, training opportunities, funding opportunities, so that we can continue to see um, tourism businesses, specifically Indigenous, own and led, um, thrive in our tourism economy. I think I'm going to pause there. I'm sure there's many questions to follow. Um, the original original is our, the primary uh, program that I lead in the development department, um, but we do also have um, other pillars that we focus on. So while I'm in the development side of things, we also focus on international travel trade and marketing. Um, our leadership pillar is very strong up amongst our executive team who work on those partnerships that are critical in ensuring that ITAC um, has a sustainable future. And then we also have a partnerships division that works with our provincial and territorial associations across Canada. Um, again, very integral to the success of not just our our organization, but the Indigenous tourism sector across Canada. Um, it wouldn't be without that tight knit fabric and network of support across the provincial and territorial associations. Um, and, and we rely on those partnerships heavily so that we can have um, different degrees of connection with Indigenous nations, Indigenous peoples and businesses, and really support their needs from a micro to macro level. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, and we'll have at least 20 minutes to answer questions. So if people in the room wants to start thinking about questions, even online, you can pop them in the chat. Um, and I think a question that came up for me, uh, Genevieve, is like, how would you address climate action within your members? Like, do you come together like in person or do you have like some resources or networks for them? Yeah, so I'd say our biggest um, opportunity for Indigenous tourism operators to discuss and share the ways that they address climate action is through our um, International Indigenous Tourism Conference. Each year we host um, this conference at different locations across Canada, but this is where we really focus and drill into some of those challenges or issues that our members are facing. This could look like water shortages or water access to water. This could look like um, addressing climate in disruptions such as wildflowers that we saw across Canada um, to uh, ways that we can preserve or conserve uh, wildlife habitat um, and other aspects of the, the land and the ecology that these businesses operate under. Uh, one really great example is, and I'm not, I'm, for those who are in BC, I'm sure are, are familiar with this operator, but they're called uh, Spirit Bear Lodge. And they're one of our, our flagship star um, businesses that we often like to uh, recommend or use as an example. And they're a really great, um, I guess, example of how they've integrated not just Indigenous tourism business in their community as a, a community-owned business, but they've really worked to um, 
conserve and protect the land that the spirit bears or Komodi bears live in. So not only are they addressing um, protection from environmental perspective, but they're utilizing the revenue that they're gaining from tourists coming to their eco lodge to ensure that um, research is continued, conservation efforts are continued, not just from the spirit bear perspective, but also from uh, land protection and hunting rights. So we often um, have these discussions again at our international conference. Um, from an organizational perspective, we're still very much, in, I'd say in our infancy in developing programs specifically around climate action. Um, one of our larger issues is um, economic stability and ensuring economic sovereignty in within our tourism businesses. So while we do focus on securing finances and, and funding opportunities, uh, we also are looking at modeling for uh, resources, training, and program de development so that we can uh, elevate the stories and the, the practices that our businesses are doing, but also understanding what the baseline for specifically for Indigenous tourism looks like from a sustainable and regenerative perspective. Love it. Thank you. Is there any question online or in the room? Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah. Mark? Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, my name is Daniel. I am from Peru. And my question is regarding the initiative that you are running on Zambia. Yeah. Are you sort of integrating indigenous knowledge from indigenous people from there or using traditional ecological knowledge from the people of Zambia to bring back these sort of uh, groups? Yes, uh, absolutely. And um, it, it's certainly not, um, you know, the, just uh, the idea from a white guy like me deciding is a great idea. It was <clears throat> my uh, co-founder and I, like he, we met in Zambia when I first worked there in uh, 2008. And, you know, so that was a time when we were in a, a different sort of climatic realm, really. But we had talked a lot about sorghum uh, at that time. And then, you know, 10 years later, when we first got to it, was we were coming off of a really difficult year. You know, we were catching up and he had shared, yeah, we're at a, you know, it's, facing a pretty critical moment where where corn is um bringing this level of vulnerability to the community and we you know we we're naturally talking about sorghum which we had spoken about lots before and um we just i just said okay well what like what kind of program do you think like we think that we could get a few farmers going and it really just started as an experiment where we just said okay let's take 40 farmers make this offer he, you know, he was an agronomist, so uh, an absolute expert in the the delivery of the of the programming. had had taught and facilitated workshops before, and it was, um, yeah, mostly mostly coming from his brain was the uh, uh, the more valuable half, I would say, to the to the launching of the project, and then I. Um, I think it brought a lot of uh, fundraising and a little bit of structuring the the program in the organizational direction to the to the table. But um, yeah, it was more. And his 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 brothers are actually now managing the the project on the ground. But it's 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 primarily them. I'm just the uh, the guy that you see when you come to the session in Canada. <laughs> Is that it? Answer your question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And then you had another question for someone else, maybe? Uh, I have other question for Genevieve. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, you know, we, uh, we were learning here on the program that sustainability is more about reducing harm and right. to preserve the resources for the future. But regenerative is more about um, trying to create initiatives that ignite self-organization and is like instill life to produce more life. And it's like a virtual circle, right? And those are some related with place-based initiatives. So 
when tourism is in this industry where there is a lot of mobility, I would like to, because I'm an ignorant on the subject, I would like to understand a little bit more, a little bit more on which is the regenerative, regenerative component of the tourism industry. Sir, do you mind repeating that last section there? Just uh, glitched out for a little bit. I didn't quite hear it. Yeah, my, my question will be is to ask you if you can explain us a little bit more about which is the regenerative component of the initiatives that you are running. What is the, it shows that indigenous comp the, of the, the yeah. programs that I'm running? Regenerative uh, component. Yeah. Oh, regenerative. Um, programs that we're running. Uh, so like I had said before, we are right now um, producing programs um, and just looking at the modeling that we can offer for our Indigenous tourism businesses. Um, the original, original accreditation program is is our fundamental and foundational program that we hope to continue to evolve over the years. Uh, it was launched just a year and a half ago. So ideally um, from my, my position and from my background, I'd like to see an, integrate, an integrative uh, resource or training um, program within the original, original accreditation program that offers tools, um, and resources for Indigenous tourism businesses to better transition their business operations into a more of a regenerative tourism model. So really looking at this shift um, from kind of a Western mechanistic perspective to more of that living systems um, and and restorative perspective. So looking at the world as a living ecology rather than this hub and spoke machine that is more extractive. So what would that look like? It would look like um, within the application program, for example, uh, we would have, uh, I guess, an extensive section around regenerative tourism practices. If those businesses have gaps within that section, we would have those resources for them to address. So that might look like funding for them to hire a consultant or a regenerative um, advisor to help implement those programs or do environmental assessments. Um, or maybe it's a baseline measurements around uh, their greenhouse gas emissions, what they're doing for infrastructure development. Um, I mean, the opportunities are, are quite extensive. Um, we also wanna think about when when we are putting these programs together, how they're mutually um, beneficial for not just the business, but for community. And that's a big piece that we look at. So not just from an ecological perspective, but the, the social perspective. And we want to see that reciprocal um, relationship with people and place. And that's from a tourism operator perspective, but also when they're hosting travelers. And that's another component, obviously, to the tourism industry is how do we um, provide teachings and this wisdom or code of conduct for travelers when they're visiting those sensitive areas. So we hope to develop those within the programs um, over the next couple of years, uh, of course, in consultation and in partnership with um, all of our members across Canada, because that is going to look very unique um, within, you know, different ecological systems and environments uh, to also integrating the differences of traditional um, ways of, of being. So it'll be quite a large um, project and, and I hope to see that integrated sooner rather than later. That's where, that's where my passion comes from. Um, so that's that's where my motives and, and values lie, especially contributing um, professionally into an Indigenous organization. Uh, so we still have a lot of room for opportunities and, and growth and not just looking again, like I uh, shared before, not just the economic contributions that the industry provides, but also um, the ecological ones. Thank you for this. And I see in the chat, um, question for Claire, do your company support research project by students? And if yes, uh, who do we reach out to? And I would like to also open up the floor to some students. I think sometimes what we forget is that we meet with employers and then we think of, oh, I have an internship to do in my career. But we do tons of apply uh, research as well uh, during our program. So I think we were chatting with MGM. Sometimes we don't necessarily learn about sustainability or climate action, but we can build like use our assignment to work with any organization. And 
kind of work on a real life project or, or yeah. So if you have any, I think Claire, we chatted about it. So if you have any examples. Yeah. Um, so in short answer, yes, we do. And um, I actually, um, it's a, it's a personal passion of mine to look at ways that we can actually link academia and industry a bit more because I think it's it's the future. Um, and we actually, I just finished a project um, just about a month or so ago, which was with a University of Calgary student, actually a, a postgrad student there looking at um, developing uh, different methods for assessing uh, climate risk. Um, and we actually did a it was it was really good. We we did a pro bono project with a, a trails association um, in Alberta to help them assess how climate change might affect their infrastructure and their infrastructure. They're a ski trails um, group mostly. And so looking at, you know, how how might snow conditions change in the future? Um, and we, like I say, we did that with a University of Calgary student. Um, we also have um, some research projects that we are looking at at the moment. We're just in the very early stages of about understanding um, how um, how some of the, the stormwater infrastructure to assess how we can assess that vulnerability to climate change. So yes, we absolutely do um, support research projects and they are they tend to be projects that are obviously in the vein of the type of work that we do, um, but we are certainly open to, to for people to reach out. And um, I'll just let Harika speak a little bit more as to how that process works for reaching out. Hi, I'm so sorry. Um, so thanks, Claire. Um, exactly to what Claire alluded to, and uh, to reach out uh, and inquire if those opportunities exist with us, you can email us um, just the gist of what you're working on and which uh, you know school you're part of and the program um, and the type of mentorship or overseeing that you're looking for uh, to the email address recruit at michaelhaney.com. And that will give us the ability to uh, direct your inquiry to respective uh, teams that um, can assess the capacity uh, of the team to offer that mentorship. And I just popped that email address in the chat there. Fantastic. And I'll share it with Thank the recruit. It's wonderful. Thank you. Amy, do you mind asking the question to... Um... Brand that How we did. You know that I had a call. Oh, I mean, we did have at the beginning. <laughs> no, I just had a question around. Um, I guess it's it was. I was thinking it was for Brent, but it might be for everyone around. Just like delicate conversations. So, I'm thinking maybe some of your clients. You said like they might be cheating or greenwashing, and like how do you have those conversations with your clients? But I think that's kind of relevant to all speakers in terms of mm -hmm. maybe having delicate conversations with, I don't know, like other food services organizations or governments, and kind of playing this balance of holding the folks that we work with accountable, but not creating enemies. I don't know if you can speak to that at all. Well, in the compliance markets, uh, the Excel sheets were, they were massaging data or formulas, right? You see incorrect uh, potentials on greenhouse gas. Um, that's where we found most of the cheating happening. Um, when it, our software is built where they, it takes that away. So that's an upfront that there's no more shell game using mm -hmm. Excel, but also the emissions uh, are also documented. So if they're going to omit uh, a certain area that they said that is non-quantifiable uh, before or had such a margin of, of, of risk, uh, there was no methodology for documenting that, that's where we work uh, with consulting agencies or work with uh, validating bodies to come up with a methodology to start documenting that. So we've, we've tried to close as many of those loopholes, but they work just as hard if it's cost effective to try and circumvent those. So I don't know if there's a way we've just added a transparent lens mm -hmm. into all of any time there's an expense from that company <laughs> that gets documented and they have to account for that. Uh, we do all the calculating to add that transparency and validity. We also document if there is an area where they're omitting uh, that from the reporting, right? Uh, a framework that's easy to read for someone that's auditing. So we tried to do everything we possibly can to capture that because generally uh, an emission is created when there's an expense or revenue generated carbon intensity based on a dollar value. So yeah, um, tech is coming a long way. It's uh, even fleet management, for example, tracking all these different vehicles when they 
switch their fleet over. So it tells, uh, we have an API, so the direct integration to this fleet management reports back into, say, their employee travel to other vehicles. And when you have uh, custom emission factors for that one company, it'll track if they've done, if they switch from diesel um, rock trucks to uh, natural gas or whatever that fuel switching is to get that difference. It's actually logging a very granular. Uh, yeah, so we're trying to add as many of these uh, getting away from a human documenting the emission factors mm -hmm. to IoT and uh, as well as making sure that um, the actual calculations uh, reconcile with the expenses and that our carbon intensity reconciles versus any manual entries. So we're trying our best, but naturally the garbage in, garbage out on the data that they send us to, right? So, yeah. Does that answer? I think so. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm curious, like how we sort of spoke to it, like just trying to remove the cheating rather than like trying to speak to your clients and be like, do you even realize you're cheating? Or like, well, so they know. <laughs> they just have you they use they use uh well no they there's just they use um massaging or you know working in different different models right so it's a matter of well here's the standard here's the methodology that everyone else is using here's you know either science-based targeting you know for their reductions and meeting these so right so we, we try and pick uh, like, you know, if you're ISO 14064, if everyone's familiar, uh, so going through and being able to document and following these standards catches a lot of those gray area pieces. But uh, I think there's no silver bullet on stopping this. It's a matter of the integrity of the data that's going into a system to report. But I'm assuming if you're hired, that there's some will that they have behind the scenes to to make some change, right? Like if you're at the table doing that work, then yeah. I would assume that like there may be some desire to get that to, to be a little bit more transparent and make it happen. I know it's always the bottom line of dollars. Some companies, yes, I would say in the voluntary side, the people that are using our company, for example, they really want to show in a granular way that they've incentivized all their employees to ride a bike or do car sharing, right? For the compliance, they look at our software being 200,000 less than a competitor. And it's automated and, and there's less uh, people that they need internally to handle this, right? You know, chief sustainability officer now is one person instead of say a team of five reporting. Uh, but yeah, we've run into right away where the transparency and the, and the granularity of, of our software presents an issue. When you go to reconcile and transfer say 2022 and 2021 and 2020 and 2019, our software will, will also pick up the uh, discrepancies. Mm -hmm mass calculations. So we know quite uh, quite quickly when we do uh, an NDA and we have data sets into our software, how what that margin of error was. Yeah, sorry, long wind there. No, that's good. And we can go to you, Alejandro. I say that, uh, well, I, I study Master of Global Management, which doesn't have anything to do with what is being talked here, but I'm really interested because I'm also from Peru, from the north of Peru, and we have a lot of flooding in that city. Actually, El Nino is coming this month in December, and there is a lot of mango exportation from Peru. It's a, a very important country that exports mango. So, for example, uh, uh, at the beginning of this year, the, there was like a hurricane in the city, uh, totally unexpected, which uh, made the temperature go, went up to like three or four uh, Celsius degrees, and that uh, made that the mango uh, didn't have the time to mature and being export. So I totally understand how these um, things are related also to my field, which is uh, commercial things, management. And um, so I, I'm also here to like uh, explore a little in this new industry, which I really love to be engaged to, um, but I don't have the experience uh, in this industry. I, I come from uh, finance, from banks, other things. And I would love to, um, to be more in touch with this um these new people this this industry and also uh ask you what would be like um the new positions that we can expect for a manager in the in the upcoming years like new new positions that uh, reflect the concerns of the world of, uh, around these uh, issues right thanks uh yeah Chief sustainability officer seems to be the trend with uh, any publicly traded company. 
Um, but I think more or less looking at uh, the European Union does a really good job at emissions reporting. And that is slowly, with a lot of resistance, working its way. California has just passed uh, emissions reporting for certain companies. This will, uh, you know, Canada's been talking about have, having a, a mechanism or an organized process of, of reporting. But I think within companies, you look at the consumer trend right now, 49% uh, of consumers, uh, that's an important factor is the sustainability of a service or a product right now, but it's, but we're trending up significantly. Every year we seem to be going up by a couple percent right now. Um, women lead that category. Men are, are, are down in that category. And then as you go through the demographics, it, it, it's all over the map, but generally that trend is pushing up. So consumers, you, you know, when you're making that choice of, you know, bananas and one's organic and one's not, there's a price difference between the two, right? There's a lot of shoppers now that understand the pesticides. Now there's been more uh, data and, you know, documentaries behind uh, some of the, the ill effects. So you have this, uh, this consumer trend and generally industry will follow that consumer trend when it becomes 51% that people care, you'll start to see businesses in the volunteer compliance. But I think, you know, Canada is behind, but that European side, pretty much every business um, has to report emissions and they have a cross-border adjustment mechanism now to capture what was a loophole for products that are being imported to the EU. So as a company that is of medium to large, Having someone to look after that reporting, documenting, and leading the internal education and external um, uh, marketability of, of these changes in sustainability is something that every company will have to address, no matter if they think it's reality, if they believe in climate change, it will be regulated in the near future. And for those companies that are, are new uh, or in a, in a, in a voluntary framework, like in most of Canada, it's a huge opportunity that you're not in a saturated market. You actually have a market advantage by doing this mm -hmm. and reporting and showing all these initiatives. So I think every company should create a, a sustainability uh, branch or, or uh, responsible. And that's from bottom position all the way to executive to, to C-suite uh, is making sure that everyone is making changes. That's amazing. And can I add something? Yeah, and I'll pass it over online. Uh, would you know, would you see that like, tech skills as well, because I'm thinking of some program we have here and some student I met that they're like, oh, I'm all about AI and I'm all about social media. Is that helpful in the climate action world? What would they say? And then we'll go, we'll continue just because I know you're the tech person here. <laughs> I'm actually the only person uh, on my team that does not have a comp size. So, uh, um, yeah, so Tech is great, like AI is advancing so much and the, the useful piece to it is aggregating data and looking at um, areas of opportunity, scanning documents. Um, you know, we look at, uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, the different uh, native species in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, we're looking at um, um, uh, Moringa. And yeah. Moringa is, uh, once again, a very climate resilient. It yeah. doesn't need a lot of water. It, it grows, it, uh, it sequesters carbon at 20 times the rate of uh, a standard uh, uh, plant. So using AI, we can start to parse through all of these different methodologies or uh, possible applications of, say, native species for that area to be able to represent based on this geographical in the water. You, once you have these large data sets, I think it's really, you can make big changes with AI now. It's still at its infancy of, of documenting all these different processes in native species, but we're getting very, very close. And I'd say within a few years, you should be able to put a geographical bound in, in you know, if it's uh, Zambia, if it's uh, Namibia or South Africa, you know, uh, the very different climates between those three places. Mm -hmm. uh, and it should be able to give you an idea of what would be the, the highest carbon sequestration, but also the economic value right, of what these carbon offsets would go for, depending on the frameworks. And I think that works. The First Nations is a huge opportunity, being stewards of the land, to tie in circular economies. You look at uh, nations uh, that have land code and uh, the taxation ability on businesses by re uh, requiring businesses to report their emissions, but also generating, you know, you look at First Nations, such as West Bank First Nations, been, their forestry industry has been decimated by the forest fires, is being able to tie in um, you know, wind, solar, uh, direct air capture, different ways to to uh, to generate income, 
and have the tax base, have these businesses, but also the consumers being able to feed that circular economy within in a First Nation. So I think there's definitely a huge opportunity uh, with having large land because First Nations are also the ones who are most directly affected. Rural community, water, flood. Uh, you know, if you take a drive through the interior, you'll see the flood, the fire damage, and uh, you know it's directly directly affecting them the most. And there's also the biggest opportunity for them. So. Uh, kind of back to the original mm -hmm. question, the AI component, uh, <clears throat> the tech side of it, I think it's more, um, it, it's a big piece. There's a big data piece that's missing right now. You have all these industries that are not reporting into a collective system. You know, Apple reports their emissions on every single source. There's a communication piece that needs to be solved that has not been solved yet. And that's tying uh, all of your upstream and your downstream suppliers, right? All of that data, even if you get into your scope to emissions, BC Hydro is really focusing on all of their vendors so that you have a very accurate uh, scope mm -hmm. to emissions set for your self primary data set. So that's a piece that if there's anyone in the room who has a has a solution for that, I know blockchain is a key piece to that. So there's a mix of that and uh, entrepreneurship and, and, and a mind thinking outside the box to solve this issue. Great ideas for research students there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead, Claire. Yeah, I, I, uh, I just wanted to to sort of respond to the comments as well about you know p positions in this this area in the future, and it was interesting there to hear about you know this idea of a chief sustainability yeah. officer. I yeah, it's uh, when we when we first sort of started our sustainability group here in uh, in McElhaney, that was actually one of the things we did is let's do some research as to what our competitors have and what like how we how is an industry working in this space and i will echo that chief sustainability officer was a, a title that we certainly saw a lot of and i think there um one of the things that we sort of we were focusing on when we built this group was um it's not that of course there is a role for companies to play um in similar to the emissions piece about how can they make you know how can they make themselves more sustainable and um but there is also this this other role in in like the the actually offering it as a service and looking at you know what are what are the the projects that we're we're doing now and how can we make them more sustainable and I think to some degrees it is absolutely new roles that are created but I think also it's about um thinking about um and any any career aspirations that that any of you on the call have is how can you tie sustainability into that and I think there's very very few careers that there isn't an element where sustainability knowledge is going to help you out there and then climate change resilience. And I think, um, yeah, I would certainly encourage you when you're looking at uh, at jobs going forward at specific jobs tailored to this area, but also be mindful about where you can make a change on um, jobs titles that maybe don't have that that title within them or aren't necessarily traditionally associated with with the climate change and sustainability world. Yeah, I just make a comment too. Uh, I think you know we're we're a climate resilience organization, and I think that all of the roles that we're looking at and looking at building out, I think, are going to draw on a variety of different skills, but we'll still be supporting like a, a climate resilience mission, right? So, right now we're a little bit resource constrained as we move from small, easier to get grants to some of the uh, the bigger, more stable sources of financing and in that in-between phase like fundraising is really important for us so I mean I think you mentioned social media and data like both of those are um, key roles and key like key competencies that uh, we're looking for right we've got a whole bunch of data I don't think that we're doing the greatest job yet of using that data to tell a story to present it um, in ways that are going to position us best uh, to get some of the funding that we can in this middle zone that we're in. So, yeah, I think I think there's a, a, a ton of skills. I don't think that you, <clears throat> it has to be looked at as narrow as like being an absolute climate expert. I think we're in an era where, you know, climate resilience is becoming like, I mean, let's even just call it an industry, right? And there's a lot of different roles from bookkeepers to boots on the ground to 
entrepreneurial thinkers or like all, I think all kinds of uh, technical still skill sets are totally applicable to the, the climate challenge. Yeah. Thanks. Genevieve, do you have something to add on this one? Yeah, from, from the tourism industry perspective, um, I would say that in the next 10 to 15, 20 years, we're going to see an increase in opportunities for positions like chief sustainability officers, um, those who can offer both qualitative and quantitative um, expertise is going to be really important. In the industry from a national perspective, we're having these conversations and they've obviously been, have been had over the last 20, 30 years, but we're still grappling with these terms such as regenerative tourism. And I did want to touch on kind of the, the greenwashing component because the tourism industry, I think, is guilty for um, having a bit of a reputation, not not extensively, but for you know a good portion of businesses who who you know share that they have green green practices when they don't. Um, the tourism industry doesn't have hard hard um, policies around that, or even frameworks to ensure that there's a compliance across Canada. So as we move forward and take this more seriously as an industry, we're going to need those people in those roles to lead the, the change. And, and um, I think that uh, those of you who are sitting today um, could definitely benefit the tourism industry, absolutely, with the, the knowledge that you're learning in the classroom today. Wonderful, and I'm mindful of time. I know some folks, I told you 2.30 and it's 2.50, but maybe to wrap up, um, I see a question from Alejandra. What professional association would you suggest students follow to grow their networks? Um, and maybe even we can touch on your other question, Alejandra, about um, how can you suggest students to use their academic learning around climate and sustainability into the job application, job search, in order to secure an interview opportunity? Uh, that's two big questions, but I don't know if anyone wants to. <laughs> so I can, I can, I can respond to that one. So with regards to the the first question about in you know incorporating it into job applications and and interviews, um, it sounds like a bit of a cliche, but like I'd almost say don't try too hard. If this is something you're passionate about, then just let let that passion shine. And I know here at McElhaney, like we have a, we have a scholarship that's for climate. Uh, climate change and sustainability and and one of the consistent things that we see come through there is just this is something that people are really passionate about and I think it's it's really great for for those of us in the industry to hear about the projects that you're doing on, in like in your academic work because it it does really show you know technologies and and processes and systems and ideas that we're probably not even thinking about in industry yet so just be passionate about what you what you've done and the things that interest you and I think that will really truly shine through and and talk about why this is important to you why is sustainability why is climate change important is it because you want to improve communities is it because you have this bigger vision and and to be honest I, I think that will just kind of come through in itself um and to the second point about professional associations um I um I'm a, a part of the engineers and geoscientists of, of BC and the, the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta. Those are two kind of engineering associations. There, um, there's another group that um, which is looking at the climate risk world and they have a, a um, practitioners network and I'll drop the link into the into the chat here. Um, as well and so I think those are those are good things to follow and you know that ties in again with that idea of just your passion and when you're you know if you're talking about this in things like your cover letters when you're when you're applying for jobs is is to be personal and you can talk about the fact that you've you know associate you've looked up some of these associations and this is why it's important and interesting to you. I think if I'd add a thought to, to thanks Claire I think that is great advice on on both questions <clears throat> and then I think one of the other things with with looking to grow your networks I think professional associations can be an absolutely great way to do it and I would also just say like there's there's also just a lot of other ways to to grow your network and sometimes it's 
getting a little bit uncomfortable and just getting out of the building, getting out of your house, getting to that mixer, whether it's, you know, a green drinks or even like this event here. Right. But just don't be afraid to get out to everything. Cause it really in touching base in person, it's something that we haven't done as much of over the course of the last couple of years with, with COVID. But I think it really is, just a great way to to build a connection and yeah there's 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 more of those opportunities out there than we might think but we have to be bold enough to get out to them i'll put the question back and you can follow your your new friend daniel here that is coming to all climate events <laughs> but you're right you're building connection even within railroads i think is important it's a good easy step i would say <laughs> Anyone else? Brad, do you have I uh, put in the chat just a few associations um, that would be great to connect with locally and nationally. Of course, you can be an industry partner um, under our membership program. Uh, so that's for non-Indigenous people or businesses. Um, and that gets you connected to the industry from a national perspective. But there's also the provincial and territorial associations that are always really great to become members um, with just so that you can again stay engaged in their newsletters they usually post opportunities for jobs or volunteering or even just understanding where the gen like the general trends are going within the industry um, for fi they've shifted their their goals and mandates quite significantly over the last year so they would be a really great one to connect uh Calum is uh, if the, for those of you who don't know, uh, he's one of the senior directors um, who is responsible for sustainable development on Vancouver Island. So he would be a great person to connect with. Um, and then there's their larger organizations like Eco Canada or Tourism for SDGs, which is a branch of the UNWTO. So those are all just ones that I, I kind of thought off on the top of my head um, for, for those who are wanting to connect more on the tourism industry side of things. I'll share all those links yeah, with the recording so we can have them handy. And Brent, anything to add on those two beautiful questions before we wrap up? And we can stay for a few minutes of networking. Sure. Uh, I would say a local place. You mentioned green drinks is a great one to mm -hmm. talk about uh, climate with uh, other passionate people in Victoria. But Quench is, if anyone's been to Quench, if they haven't, it's uh, 2031 Store Street. That's it's a co-working space, uh, permanent offices, hot desking, but they have events there all the time. Um, Shopify with all their executives are there. You'll have uh, so many different people you'll meet that, and it's it's a hub of growing companies. They're looking for local talent, uh, and pretty much everyone there has a focus on uh, climate. It, you, know, you have to have that a part of their resume now as a concern, in, in my opinion. So, yeah. What's the name of game? It's Quench, K-W-E-N-C-H. It's Club Quench. Uh, it is, once again, it's hot. When you walk up to it, uh, you know, you'll have low expectations. There's a, a country <laughs> bar down below, but once you get inside, you realize <laughs> that it's uh, the top startups in Victoria, but also great companies are starting up. The Fatso peanut butter, that was their kind of their incubator out of there. I know Royal Roads, UVic have their uh, mm -hmm. incubator there. So it's just a great place to to network. And I think we found 80% of our employees from that environment uh, for mm -hmm. Nature Blocks. So, you know, because yeah. I was mentioning then, Mark, we met at yeah, the Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. the other one is the Doc yeah. uh, Social for Center for Social Impact, uh, where Nancy and I met is also just great. I think like... Same idea, co-working space, you know, and all folks who are in like working on whether it's a business uh, approach or a nonprofit approach to either a social or a climate issue. So and yeah. similarly also having lots of events all the time. Yeah. And I don't know about Quench, but I like at the doc, if you're a student, you can volunteer a few hours and you get free access so you can participate to most events as well. Yeah. Looking for those opportunities. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. That was wonderful. I love that. You can use maybe your computer. If, if student, you want to connect with people online, and I'll just stop the recording and we can have conversation. But if our uh, panelists online want to stay and if people want to unmute as well, we can stay just a few more minutes. But thank you so much. That was such a pleasure to share the space with you all. Stop the recording. <laughs>